And I'm going to encourage you, if you have your Bible or your electronic Bible, thank you. I have this standard equipment. It's paper. So I just want to invite you to consider if you were not able to take your phone out and get a photograph of that little barcode in front of you, you're going to receive today's message outline and maybe even encourage yourself to take notes. We really do welcome that. We're trying to go touchless in our environment. I see so many of you are you're breaching that protocol, and do a, but we're trying to do the best we can. But welcome also you who are online. You probably have already downloaded today's outline, and we want to welcome you to do just that. Hey, let's begin. Now, it's interesting. I just heard about a man who went into a country store, and as he was going onto the porch, he noticed a young boy and his dog sitting next to him. And so the young The man said, hey, does your dog bite? And the young boy said, no. And so he reached down to touch the dog, and the dog bit him. And he said, I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. And he says, that's not my dog. (laughs) So you can imagine here, sometimes partial truth can get you in trouble and even get a person upset. And so today, we're just lunging into a new series. That series is entitled Resolving Anger, Resolving Anger. And I want to encourage you to find the book of Genesis. That's where we're going today. The series is Resolving Anger, but today's message, the first part, is entitled, What Do You Say to an Angry Friend? What do you say to an angry friend? I'm sure that you've been fully informed of the tragedy in Minneapolis, the response around our nation, the continual response to what's happening with COVID around the world, People are getting upset with partial truths, whole truths, maybe reactions, who's doing what. Some people are saying to me, well, this is, this is really affirming my stereotypes, like, watch out, please, hold on. I've been doing a lot of listening, and it's been very helpful. I really, because I'm lamenting so much of what I'm seeing and hearing, and then I listen. I've been in some great listening tanks. And then out of listening, I get a chance to learn. So lament, listen, and learn. And so it's very helpful to be able to see. I I just recognize one thing. I did not understand about racism and the extent of what's happening here until you hear somebody's story on how they're troubled even to go out at night. It's just a challenge at times to see and to hear people and realize, I just did not recognize that. I mean, I've been pulled over by the police many a times. I've never been dreadfully afraid. But when you hear other people's story about being pulled over, it's maybe I'm missing some things. So I know this. Jesus hates racism. I hate racism. Our first message last time we were together was, Let's focus on Christ, not on crisis. But we realize there are people that are just angry, and maybe you have just been swooned into that environment because when people are angry, sometimes you kind of reflect that. It comes on, and so our series is so important, Resolving Anger. I do know this, that I just feel like the heart of Jesus when I just spotted in Luke chapter 19, verse 42. Remember the words of Jesus, and he said, Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Can you imagine that that could be happening in our own nation? Oh, we want peace, but maybe it's hidden from our eyes. Let's even pray before we proceed any further, shall we? Thank you for joining with me. Father, we just humble ourselves once again and say, Lord, would you lead us in our time of not only your word, but Lord, we... I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. So, Lord, help us to be a part of the solution in any facet of our own individual lives. But for your glory, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to let you know, I'm feeling very confident we're about to hit a great revival. It's already happening in our nation. I'm, every great revival in America has always happened in some dark times. In 1856, there was a terrible recession. That recession fostered in an awakening in 1857 
that brought in a president named Abraham Lincoln. The Great Depression in 1929, that brought in a tremendous influx of church attendance that lasted for 30 years and stopped in 1960. So it's amazing here we are facing some difficult days, but it is not a time for you to be afraid, and it is not a time for you to somehow start to proclaim doom. I understand scriptures, and I realize there's going to be a time frame of Christ's return, but we're seeing people's hearts turn toward the Lord. I'm grateful for our Foursquare president, Randy Remington. If you are part of and receive the emails from Foursquare, if you don't, would you go on the website, The Foursquare Church? Our president has asked for three days of prayer, fasting, and lament. So starting tomorrow, starting tomorrow, the 15th of June, and it ends on the 17th, Wednesday at 5 o'clock, an international prayer time, so I did not know about it, something that our new president when he was elected, say, the pillar I'm going to start with my presidency is going to be a pillar of prayer. <laughs> He's going for it. Would you join us as well? Would you join us, the Foursquare Church, and be a part of that? I'm grateful. Well, I'm just so glad the opportunity I have to be with like-minded people who love Jesus. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here today. The beauty of caring for people, especially God's people, is just so wonderful because we know this four things. We've all been made by God. We've all been made in the image of God. That's two things. And we've all been made with variety, distinction. That even means color of skin. And the fourth thing is so important. That's why we do what we do with missions. We are all called to have a relationship with Almighty God led by the Holy Spirit because of the cross of Jesus. Every man, every woman, every boy and girl. So anger can be a real distraction sometimes. If you've ever been in that, anger is, is just a, an emotional irritation that can come upon any one of us. You've been embarrassed emotionally or physically. I, I can see, and I've even had times waiting in line to check out. You could feel sometimes the little anger start to come in there. Not you. I can see you all look so good this morning. It's amazing how anger can kind of come in and our ability to just problem solve. Have you said, I'm going to leave that line because that one's going faster, and then that one doesn't, that slows up. It's like, what is going on? So we have to be careful about that. We're dealing with this. This area of anger, you are all so young and you don't remember September 11, 2001, 9-11. Immediately after when America was attacked, there were bumper stickers that went out and it literally said, don't get mad, get even. And that was, that was big in our states, kind of like carried over all of a sudden. Somebody gets you mad, you, you just get even. So we have to be aware of, sometimes some of us have been brought up into that environment. I want to just highlight there are three main emotions in the Bible, especially the New Testament. Three main ones. Here they are. First is really compassion. That's where you feel, you feel for the person that's hurting. That's a good thing. The other is sorrow. You really want to mourn with those who are mourning, rejoice with those who are rejoicing, but sorrow. And the, and the third, it's a strong one, it's, it is anger. It's a reaction. It's an emotional irritation that happens. And it can be for anything. Sometimes it could come on because of your own selfishness. I'm angry because somebody has something nice done for them that's not been done for me. So it can come in a variety of ways. We have to be careful about that. So as we deal with this, we're going to look now at Genesis chapter 4, Genesis is a great book. It's amazing. Everything that you and I know as a civilization originates from Genesis. That's why you never want to just say, well, the book's just a book. Or even say, well, we all evolved. Why are we wearing clothes today? Book of Genesis says. How come we all have different languages? <laughs> book of Genesis tells you where that came from. 
How is it we're all kind of like messed up and it's not a perfect world? What happened to that? Well, book of Genesis. And, and it's in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Most feel that that is called what we would say the root of sin. Where did sin come from? Well, Adam and Eve. God just says, man, have a great time. Name all the animals. Eat all the food you can handle, but just don't eat that one fruit from that one particular tree. Genesis 3. Genesis 4 now, where we're going, is the fruit of sin. Cain and Abel, the story of Cain and Abel. Let's take a look at it together. I'm in verse 1, and it says, Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, I just, you know, having children born is such a miracle. You can imagine, first child she had. It, and it's nice to know, I've acquired this man cub from God. I think that's something we always need to take a look like, man, children are such a blessing from the Lord. It's not just a happenstance from some passion. But I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, verse 2 says, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So one of the boys is a farmer. The other one's a shepherd. And in the process of time, it, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock, of his flock, and of, goes on, it says, their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. This is the first indication of somebody bringing first fruits to God. I like that. I think it's wonderful. We're not quite sure why Cain's offering was not accepted. There are some conditions. It doesn't say he brought the first fruits. He just said he brought a portion of his produce. And, and you know, if you're going to be blessed, your, your salary increase was your flock started to multiply and your you had a great harvest season. It's like, man, I got a pay raise. I'm going to thank God. Here we go. Here we go. But in this time frame, Cain's upset and his countenance falls. I don't know if you've ever seen you just have the best time and all of a sudden somebody like turned off the lights on that person and their countenance falls. And then the Lord came to Cain. And this is where we get our title. What do you say to an angry friend? Isn't it wonderful how the Lord walked with Adam in the cool of the evening. Here we're still at the beginning of the setup of creation, and now God shows up to say, hey, Cain, what's going on? It's very kind of the Lord. We're not sure, doesn't say why Cain's offering was not accepted. We do know Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 says that Abel, by faith, offered a more, uh, basically a more acceptable offering so maybe Cain's offering wasn't really offered in faith. Maybe he's more duty-bound. Have you ever been there? Like, I'm only at church because somebody told me I need to come or I can't be taken out to lunch today. So you can imagine that's not going to wow God you're here. But for the Lord to come up to Cain, he asks, why are you angry? It's so nice of the Lord to approach Cain that way. And why? Has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. One of the things about, I don't know if you've ever really been caught in some real habit-forming sin, but sin's not just wants to be your buddy one night or one week. Sin, if any of you have trafficked in that, and so many of us have been set free from bondage or addictions, glory to God. But if there have been times that you have succumbed to sin again, sin often will take a person farther out than they want to go away from God for a much longer time than they ever intended to stay away from God. That's why the Lord's saying, hey, if you do well, man, it's going to be a good day. If you're not, be careful. There's something called sin, and that's why Jesus came, and it's desires for you. In verse 8, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. 
Now, we don't know what the exchange was. We could just assume that Cain was probably jealous of his brother, probably bitter at his brother. He's getting all the accolades. And then when he told his brother Abel why he's just so upset, his brother says, hey, why don't you just kind of like, you know, like so many of us as Christians, you tell somebody that's angry, losing it, they're losing everything. Why don't you give your life to Jesus? Right away, they get upset with you. But here we have Cain kills his brother. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? I know the Lord gives him a second chance, isn't it? I, I'm telling you, I've had many chances. He gives Cain a second chance, and Cain shows no regard for God or his brother. Where is Cain, your brother? Verse 9 says, he's... He said to God, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Blood's a very powerful ingredient. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus says. And so in the process of that, things happen. Verse 16, if you're in your Bible, you'll see that literally Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. God harbors this murderer, protects him, really. The mercy of the Lord is so great. It's amazing. Psalm 103, verse 8. You may want to write that down where it says that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He's merciful to Cain once again. He's been merciful to Paul Harmon. And so when we take a look here, there are some things we want to talk about as we start this series Three points, three facts about anger. Number one, anger is futile. Anger is futile, literally meaning, as we look at verse 6 and 7, is that it really, futile means it really serves no useful purpose. You can get angry. People are going to say, wow, you're just, your countenance falling. Why are you angry? But something about that, it serves no purpose. And if you take a look, even on your overhead, you can see James 1 19 and 20 is cited there, where it says, So then, my brethren, beloved brethren, talking to Christians especially, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So letter A, it really prevents you from problem solving. I don't know if you've ever been in circles, and I've been in a few over the last few weeks, and all of a sudden you have people just show rage. And it's as if the, we cannot get to any resolution. Now, we now just have to hear from one another, which is good. It's a good starting point, right? Lament, listen, and then we learn. Where do we go from here, God? But it's prevented us from any problem solving. Proverbs 16.32, you write that down, would you? Proverbs 16.32 says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. That's an amazing thing when we take a look at that because great physical strength is no comparison to those who can say, man, I'm not going to pop off and get angry quickly. Matter of fact, you're greater than a person who takes a city. If you can control yourself, myself, because the human flesh just gets so ticked off so quickly. And have you ever been in a shouting match? You had no reason to get angry, but anger just causes others to jump on in. The reaction to anger is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right with you on this one, or contend. Number two, anger is foolish. Not only is it futile, it's foolish. Letter A, it makes you justify sinning. Now, I didn't say it's foolish, and some people say, well, yeah, that's really kind of getting hard because I think we all get angry, and we do. To some, Maybe anger isn't even your issue. That's why I'm glad you're here because you're going to help somebody else. But there's something about anger. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17, on your overhead, there it is. It says, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. So I don't know if you've been in situations where a person is angry. You may want to write down Proverbs 29, 11, because it also says a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. I've been in situations where 
It's like, don't, don't get so angry. I was actually at a fundraising dinner, and I overheard a conversation from a man who asked the waiter, is there any red wine? And he said, oh, no, sir, I'm sorry. We're only serving white wine. Well, can I do whatever I want with this? Yes, sir, you can. So he goes and pours the wine out on the ground. I'm sure he probably thought he looked cool. You know, I'm going to protest this and just pour it out. He looked so foolish. I just, I felt so bad for everybody that was listening to this. I don't know if you've ever complained to the waiter and you have all your kids there. It's like, Dad, please don't say anything about the meat being overdone. Don't, don't, I'm embarrassed. Like, please, I paid for this thing. But you know, it's just, it's amazing how that is. So we have to be careful because Scripture, very clear, very rarely, we are not to call anybody a fool, but the Scripture does say that really a fool is one who's really empty-headed. They don't really think things through. They're not going to respond. I like Scripture in Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1, you can write that down, and also Psalm 53, verse 1 says the same thing. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So it's important. It goes on and says, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. So when a person gets angry, the reason why we say it's foolish is because they, they really are giving up their freedom to problem solve. They end up looking empty-headed, and they're really saying, there is no God principle acting in my decision to work through this. That's why we have to be careful about that. Be careful. The great maestro... Uh, Toscanini was, had a temper tantrum. I don't know if you ever followed him. It, whenever he did orchestra practices and his orchestra hit a wrong note, he got so angry. He was known for taking something and throwing it to the ground. He's just angry. And one day, something didn't go right in the orchestration, and he's looking for something to go and break up, and all he could find was his watch. So he took it off and went, shik poof poof so the next day, he comes for practice, and on his podium were two boxes, gift wrapped. He opens one, and it's a gold watch, and it says, from the orchestra. He opens the second one. It's a plastic watch, and it says, for practices. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be careful. Uh, Proverbs 22, verse 24, it's important, says, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. So anger really is, can be infectious. We have to be careful. I like history stories, and I don't know, probably many of you don't remember the Hatfields and the McCoys. They were so angry and had feuds, family feud, probably where the game show came from. Hundred years, in the 1880s, it started Hundred years, hundred lives lost, men, women, and even children. But in 1976, Jim McCoy and Willis Hatfield shook hands. The feud was over. Hundred years, and they both said to each other, we don't remember how this started. It's a terrible thing. So no wonder why God says that anger is futile and anger is foolish. And finally, number three, anger is forbidden. It really is. Why? Letter A, it distorts the freedom to express your true heart. Even when God approached Cain, Cain, why are you angry? And what did you do? Where's your brother? It really distorts the truth. We start justifying why that is. And you say, well, man, I just find anger so easy. Sometimes people go with angry uh, impulses because it's much better that way than being anxious or worried or afraid, so we just get angry. But God can help us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll help us. It's amazing. The, peer, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kind. It's amazing. You can see if we're going to change a society, it's like we really need to tell people about Jesus. Not just for eternity, in heaven with God, not just for fire insurance to avoid hell, but we really need change in our society. We really need that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Check out a couple more verses. 
It says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Wow, Lord, that's a list. The other one is, is found in Ephesians 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Boy, we just, there are so many things we're going to talk about. It's important with regards, because people are going to say, well, shouldn't I defend myself? Shouldn't I def Pastor Paul, are you saying I can't defend myself? Well, I'm not saying do not defend yourself. You do want to defend your spouse, your family, your nation. But when it came down, I've had people ask me, Pastor Paul, what would you do if a mob were to go to harm you? I said, if it was by myself, this is my decision. I want to maintain my integrity. And I'd be like Stephen the martyr. Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Now, I hope some of you are there to roll with your cameras and catch me going down. Isn't that great? But if I have to defend somebody, I'm going to defend somebody. There's a difference. And defend your rights, stand up for those things. We're going to talk about that. But to just get hostile, my last reference is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And that's where I want our home and our cities to be careful. Some would say, I've had this, like, hey, pastor, Bible says be angry. Yeah, you can, but you have a 24-hour period to get over it. Sun's going down. Now you're down to about 10. Get over it. Why? The motivator is, you will give place to the devil. And there are many of you who are here, and maybe you who are watching, where we've sat and said, I have seen a demon. They're very real. It can get into a culture or into a setting or into a mob scene. If you've ever seen a person who's filled with rage, you'll see there's something else there. Please remember as we wrap this up, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Nobody in your home and nobody in this room is your enemy. Ephesians 6, 12, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So we want to be mindful of what environment we're dealing with. We want to say, dear Holy Spirit, help me to be a man of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers for theirs they're going to be called sons of God. We want to be careful now, and I just want to thank you. We're off to a great start. It's a good start. I think the Lord's going to help us, and in so helping us individually, collectively, we're going to see some great breakthroughs for our nation. Would you remember to go to the Foursquare Church website, and let's sign up for our three days of prayer, fasting, and lament with our president, Randy Remington. Let me lead us in prayer now. Father, thank you for your goodness. And thank you for the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And that, Lord, where would we be without you? Who has the answers except you, almighty God? You have the word of life. And in you is no darkness at all. So, Lord, I pray along with each and every one of us, Lord, Remove the darkness and confusion off of ourselves and off of our nation. Jesus, you're the answer. You're the answer, called the Prince of Peace. So, Lord, we want to thank you and surrender our lives once again, O oh Lord, as we go into this week of praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth, right here on earth as it is in heaven. And lead us not into temptation and especially deliver us from the evil one. So, Lord, we thank you for that great prosperity. Come to your people right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today online. Thank you. And if you can, please come join us one of these days. Our doors are open. We're grateful for that. Let me pray you off a blessing right now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord cause his countenance to come upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Bye. I want to thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel, Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.